What up, y'all? This is Yadon Israel coming to you live from Lit, asking y'all to subscribe to the channel. So make sure y'all subscribed, make sure y'all liking the videos, make sure y'all commenting, and make sure you turn on your notifications that let you know when new videos are dropping. We're dropping them daily, and you want to be on it, because we on it, all right? So keep it lit, keep it locked, subscribe, we out. Mardu says a drink. What's going on, y'all? This is your boy, Yadon Israel, back again with another episode. I made a mistake on my bottle, so I'm going to be Liddy interview Fontaine for this episode of Lit, the premier platform for all things literary, swaggy, and everything in between. Today's guest, we got the wonderful poet, uh, just super dope, super swaggy, longtime friend of mine, Kamon Felix on the show. Thank you for pulling up. She pulled up, came after her, her job. She told me she's the only person... Who I, she would come for. Maybe not the only person, but one of the few. But thank you for coming through. Of we always do this thing where we talk about the fit. Mm -hmm. So you, we need you to stand up and walk us through the swag cam. Okay. Walk us through the fit. So right. cur curated. It's fashion week. It's fashion week. So we got to put you on blast. So talk to me. So um, this is like a regular little crop top situation. Okay. These, Who makes this crop top situation? Um, ASOS makes this crop All top right. situation. All right. A lot of ASOS coming through later. Yeah. You know, okay. today I wanted to go for like a sweatpants, chill, like still professional, still swaggy kind of look. Yeah. This is so like a, got, a sweat a sweat slack. Yeah. So these are like sweat slacks. And I got my little vans. Okay. And just like... You know the ring situation popping. Yeah, who these rings? Who, who makes these rings? Really big. Um, rings. this is a lot of H and M rings, but this ring belongs to Mayette. I don't know if okay. you know. I took it from some boy. Um. <laughs> okay. He not getting it back though. So. All right. And I'm loving this. I'm loving this. These, these purple extensions. Thank you. You love the purple. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it. it's my color. It's just, that's that royalty. That, that royalty. royalty. Popping. Yeah. But thank you for coming on lit. You're welcome. You're welcome. All right. So let's let's get right into it. Give us the background. Paint the picture. Come on, Felix. Come on, Felix. Who are you? Oof. I'm complicated. I'm just okay. kidding. Um, I'm a poet. Oh, shit. Wait. Rewind. Let's get this Marduce crack in as soon as possible. Okay. I need it. So, wait. Do you do you know how to do it? I feel like you... Do, do you know what we're what we doing? No, what we're doing. Okay. So, basically, what you're going to do is you're going to drink past the leaves. Okay. On the, on the Martinelli's. All right. And then I'm going to pour you up. And it's Friday. So are we doing know. it at the same time? Yeah. All right. Boom. So, cheers. Cheers to you. I know you got to you closing. How are you going to get this? Ooh. Cognac in there if you don't. All right. So All right. I'm going to swirl that up. I got to figure out why I'm going to get $60 for another bottle. <laughs> Damn right. All right. Oh, Ooh. shit. You made a mess. That's what we do here. That's what we do here. You feeling that? I think I need more. Do say. A little more, a little more. I give you a little more. Using my privilege as your longtime friend. Ah, the table getting more than anybody right now. <laughs> it's need, lit. Need a napkin. I'm not gonna get one now. I got. Boom. Just to get the thing going. All right. Oh, yeah. that's right. <laughs> that's what it's supposed to be. Supposed to be. All right now. So yeah, I'm sorry. Walk, walk us through the picture. To paint the picture again for us. Okay, who's come on? Um. I'm a poet. Uh, I'm also a political strategist. Um, I do political PR um, and strategy for um, different politicians, um, different organizations. Some of them are some of the biggest uh, nonprofits um, and advocacy organizations in the country. Yeah. Um, I won't say who they are because I don't think they matter right now, but... Not you know, in, a, in a good way. In a good way. Okay. They're just, all yeah. very good. Yes. Okay. Like, um, like if you Google me, you'll see like, come on, is a spokesperson behind such and such. Like it's it's there. Um, I'm also a poet and a writer and a thinker. Um, I did some journalism for a stint. Mm -hmm. Um, so I don't know. That's, you got the MFA at Bard. I got my MFA at Bard. My MA at um, NYU Arts Politics. So. Um, but no BA. No BA. No bachelor's. That's, that's that is one of the most impressive things. That I think you have. Yes, I skipped undergrad, yeah. um, which is like not something that I'd like necessarily intended to do. Right. It was one of those things where, like, you know, like growing up in the hood, like I graduated from high school and they were trying to tell me to go to some fuck ass colleges, these like two year programs that didn't have anything that was interesting to me, mm -hmm. nothing that I actually thought was going to be useful to my development. And then on top of it, like, 
I had been writing at a professional level since I was at least 16 Mm -hmm. um, and had been published in a bunch of other things. And so the idea of going to undergrad and studying creative writing with people who had like just encountered craft um, felt like a waste of my time Mm -hmm. and also felt like it would that my presence in the room would be a waste of their time and would be frustrating. Like I know how it feels to walk in a room where like you are trying to learn and then there's that person who's like always raising their hand like I know. I know the answer. It's like, bitch, shut up. Nobody cares. So I was already super self-conscious about being that person in the room. Um, And so I was just like, you know what? I'm just going to keep learning and building and like developing craft the way I have been, which Uh was through my community, through networking, through working with elder folks, people in the community who wanted to mentor me. And then somebody was like, you know, I really feel like you're ready for an MFA program. And I was like, uh, <laughs> and you I'm knew 19. What an MFA was yeah, I knew what 19. an MFA was in 19 for sure, which is definitely not information that I would have had had I not been so intrinsically connected to the literary landscape already at that time. Um, I knew what an MFA was. So many of my mentors were either in MFA programs that had already graduated. And somebody said, like, you're ready for an MFA. And I was like, that's mad funny. But then I couldn't stop thinking about it, right? right? And then I was, like, talking to people about MFA programs. And what I was looking for at that time, at, like, 19 and 20, I was looking for rigor, straight up, period. Like, that's why I didn't want to go to undergrad at that moment. Because I didn't feel like the education I was going to get was going to be rigorous. I knew that it was going to be intense. I knew that it was going to be difficult. But, like, not because what I was learning was going to develop me, just because college is hard. Right. Um, so I, somebody said, like, you should apply... Um, to some MFA programs that don't ask for bachelor's degrees. And I was like, there aren't that many of them. And it's true, there aren't. They're mostly organizations or universities that are pretty old, that have a lot of prestige and can like get away with... Not having that. Exactly. Right. And we got flies mm-hmm. flying Thank around, you. so I want Thank to protect you, you Marduce, for you. <laughs> yeah, keep going. Um, but yeah, so I, I applied to Bard, and they asked me to come in for an interview, and I was like, uh... <laughs> That's funny. And then I went for the interview and I left and I was like, I like felt really good, but I was still like, that was cute. I'll try yeah. again next year. And they called me the week after my interview. That's <laughs> I was dope. like, who does this? Yeah. I like weeped. I was, I was nannying at that time and it, it just felt right like such a blessing from okay. the universe. So let's go back. Okay. Let's paint. Let's go back to the crucible. The crucible. The, like the beginnings. Okay. Where are you from? From the boogie down. What part? X all day. Fordham. Bathgate. You already <laughs> snow. <laughs> From them blocks. Yeah. And then yeah. what the what the what's the family uh composition? Um so my family is all Caribbean, West Indian. My father's from Grenada, my mom's from St. Thomas. Okay. Um Island Girl Ting, Dan Noor. Um <laughs> you know, my dad's a writer. My mom's also a writer, but I didn't know that. Yeah, my my dad, um, he writes a lot of like fiction. Um, and some nonfiction, um, and a lot of like criticism, especially around like politics and things like that. Yeah. He's a professor. My mom writes too, but she's a musician actually. Okay. She's a lawyer. Um, but like growing up, she was in this band until I was like 16. It was a reggae band. Um, yes. And my mom was like one of the main songwriters. So, oh. yeah. So we have like hundreds of blood. cassettes. Yeah. This shit is in my blood. Okay. Yeah. And then your sibling situation. Oh, uh, my babies. Um, they're, they're, I'm the eldest, so they don't really have personalities yet as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Sorry. I love y'all. Um, but one is 19. She's at University of Buffalo. If y'all see my sister, watch out for my sister. Please, I'll whoop that ass. Um, <laughs> Rafi's 15. She's really annoying. I'm just kidding. I love you. Um, they're just like really smart, really interesting kids who yeah. I'm lucky enough that they really look up to me. And I'm always like, you know, you could have a better sister, but you got me. So yeah. you'll be all right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So let me ask you, what is the first thing that comes into your life? Because you, uh, you, well, basically, your your backdrop is liter- literature. Mm-hmm. But what for you made literature more immediate than just having it around? But like, this was something you would use. To sort yeah. Of, so um, the first thing you read. I'd always been like a very political person, a very political kid. I had a lot of ideas and convictions. Um, but like, I went to an alternative high school. I went to three different high schools. I used to cut school a lot. I got in a lot of trouble. I fought a lot. And so at some point. People were just straight up not listening to me, right? I mean, 
And that's just what it comes down to. Right. Like, not not about politics. People were happy to hear me talk about, like, shooting the shit and, like, being ratchet and, like, you know, smoking weed or whatever, whatever, and talking shit about other people. But nobody was, like, hearing me when I was trying to say to my friends, like, yo, there's a reason, like, why we really out here trapping at, like, 11 a.m. <laughs> and it's, like, bigger than the fact that we're idiots. Like, right? right? Like, it's, it's systemic. Um, nobody was listening to me. My teachers weren't listening to me. A lot of the feedback that I would always get at school, my parents would get, is, like, She's really smart, but, like, she doesn't apply herself, which I know that we've all heard plenty of times. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so uh, the moment, actually, the, the the moment that opened up for me, um, I was watching the Malcolm X movie. Um, I was watching Malcolm with um, one of my classes in my alternative high school. So this is, like, junior year. I'm, like, 16. Um and I'm a very, I'm a, I'm an empath. I feel things very viscerally, almost terrifyingly so. Right. Um, and this is one of the first experiences that I had that showed me that. And the moment where he shot, I like freaked the fuck out. Like I literally like weeped, ran out of the room. Mm. Like people were deeply concerned. My teacher was concerned. I was so overcome with the emotions that I felt. And I was feeling more than like anger that he was dead like fear of how the way that he was killed but I was like literally overcome with just like all this information and being like wow being black is like really scary <laughs> like this mm. is terrifying um and so my teacher was like look I don't I don't really know how to make you feel better right now teacher was white or black my teacher was black actually and so there are two teachers that are intrinsic to this story one of them her name is um Christy Keener hey Kay 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 um she was my first one of the first teachers that I like explored literature with so I would write short stories with her and things like that um and then this other teacher Kwame was who I saw the Malcolm X video with they were both English teachers okay. Um, and it was after seeing the Malcolm X video and him seeing such a visceral reaction from me, he was like, look, I know that you've been writing in KK's class, like, maybe you want to try writing about this. I don't know if you write poems, so like, maybe you want to put it into a poem, something. I was like, whatever, dog, like, whatever. But then it yeah. was like six o'clock, I was at school, I didn't have shit to do, you know what I mean? So I wrote the damn poem, um... And, you know, it's a... I know now that it was an incredibly problematic poem, it was very, like, uh... You know, like, we need to stop killing each other. We need love in the hood. Like, it was very much like that. <laughs> but um, my teacher read it, and my teacher was like, this is, like, very, very good. And we had, like, some sort of performance thing at school, and they were like, yeah. you should perform it in the front of the school. So I did. Um, and, like, not just my teachers, but, like, my peers were super moved. And, like... These are some hard ass kids. I mean, like, this is alternative school. Like, this is the last, last, oh, last resort. These badass kids, kids who just y'all badass, y'all bad. No, the, bad these badass kids, <laughs> them badass kids. No, but we were really bad, and it was, and and we seemed to be the kind of kids who were impenetrable. And so, in that moment, to be able to relate to my peers in such a profound way, that's where poetry opened up for me. Where I like looked out into the crowd, thinking that everybody was gonna be sitting there like. Rubah, shut up. Yeah. And I looked out and they were all just like, wow, like yeah. that's crazy. So your first entrance into literature is not even a book, but a, but the movie Malcolm X. The movie Malcolm X. That's dope. Mm -hmm. Um We met. When 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 we met Oh my god, at NYU. NYU. I was uh we was at the event for I think John Carlos was giving a speech and mm -hmm. the NYU BSU had did an event. Mm -hmm. And I, and I, it was something I was You were upset. I was pretty upset about the event. Yeah. And I was like spazzing in the corner yep. or whatever. And then you had come over. What what happened? Were you, I know we were by the stage. We were by the stage. I, you look like you. <laughs> well, here's really how it went down. You were super dressed really well. And it looked like you were throwing shade. And me being um, a hothead, I wanted to know what the fuck he was mad about. So <laughs> I was like, what are you mad about? And then we wound up getting into a, you know, a really complex conversation. About, Who was there with you? Was it? It was Alexis, who's my ex-girlfriend, bitch, and Jahan. Yes. Yes. My friend Jahan. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and we, we just started talking and we were just talking about like the way the event went and the things that were problematic and how we should rethink things. And at first I was like... I hear you, but like you were doing the most. <laughs> I was not. I was doing the most. I was doing the most. I was. I was. I was a lot angrier back then with nobody in particular, mm -hmm. and I didn't have language to describe mm -hmm. that anger. So you know that shit implodes. Mm -hmm. Yep. But through that, this friendship has like, blossom. you know, it, yeah, it's, and it's and it's continuing to, continuing to blossom. But mm -hmm. to get more back into you, you've. I remember visiting you one day, and you had this map mm -hmm. of 
the world and you mm-hmm. had these pins on all the places you had traveled mm-hmm. on behalf of spoken word. Mm-hmm. Doing, was it slam poetry, right? Slam. Mm-hmm. Now, give people... Slam, spoken word, whatever. Yeah, give people the language for what, like, how, one, what is slam, spoken word, poetry, and mm-hmm. how did you get into it? So, um, slam and spoken word poetry is um, performance poetry. So, slam and spoken word are two different things, okay. but they're the same medium. Slam poetry is the competitive aspect of spoken word. Um, and so, it's performance poetry that is then scored um, and evaluated by a group of... Um, Strangers, basically. Um, and, and they're all slam poets. Um, like. The judges are typically not slam poets, but okay. you compete against other slam poets. So okay. it's like walking into a room and telling everybody, hey, y'all, I need you to score these poems on a sc- scale from zero to ten. I don't care if you never heard a poem before. Uh-huh. Just score it, right? Um, and so I started doing a lot of slam at like the New York and Poets um, Cafe, and I was on the Brave New Voices 2010 team with Urban Bird, which won um, at Nationals, and we were on HBO, and it was very, it was very like at that time, it was very like cool. And you, and like, you, and you're how old at this time? I was 18, 17, okay. 17 and 18. I started slamming at 15, and sort of like put my slam hat down around like 19 or 20. Um, and that's when I transitioned into like more print and like literary work. Um, but honestly, the the day that I did that poem at school, my teacher was like, I don't know if you ever heard of slam poetry, but uh, you should check it out. And I was like, shut up, miss. Like, who cares? Yeah. And then I like went home. I remember it was raining. I was on the, B30, the BX36 and I Googled like teen poetry slam and up came Urban Words. So I went. Mm. And then my life changed. <laughs> That's mm. really how that went. And you've been and you've traveled to how many countries because of that? I actually don't remember anymore, Dang, but that many. um I have I can tell you off top that I've been to I've been to Europe a few times. Um I've been to South America once. Okay. Um and I've been to a lot of states in America. I've mm. been to Waco, Texas is one of the places that I wish to never go back to ever again. Mm. Um Why not? It was just it felt terrible. I like got off the plane and I was like, oh, no, no, no. Yeah, Why am I yeah, here? Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I've been, to a, I've been to a lot of places. And what encouraged the shift from spoken word to like what you call, not I'm not trying to like create mm-hmm. the distinction, but I want no. you to kind of de- define a distinction sure. for you between spoken word and literary poetry. So, I mean, the, they're definitely the same thing and they definitely share... Um, mediums and strengths and all that stuff. Mm. For me, the shift was not between like literary work and performance work uh, or slam poetry, but between the shift was between performing on stage and performing on the page. And so oh. I started to mm. recognize the limitations of the stage quite early. Okay. In that there were conversations that I wanted to have, subtext that I wanted to introduce, yeah. um, dualities that I wanted to play with that are really hard to do on stage. I'm not going to say that they're impossible because there are some incredible poets out there right now who are wor- doing this work on the stage who are blowing my fucking mind. But it didn't seem like something that I could do in that moment. Right. Um, and so for me, really, it was just that like I wanted to flex. I wanted more space to like. Is that, is that your guess? Flex? I wanted to flex. I wanted okay. more space to like fuck it up and and get messy. Um, and I found that white space on the page was a better medium to do that than the stage. Um, and so, like for instance, one of the first poems that I had published um, is a is a poem that's a prose block that has a lot of gaps in the block, right? And what I wanted to play with in that poem was silence and breathlessness. Um, mm. And I and I felt like. You know, being how a do you convey that on stage? Exactly, especially when, like, as a slam poet and as a performance poet, you're 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 constricted to two minutes and thirty seconds anyway. And so, oh, if you wow. want to play with space and you want to play with time and you want to play with speediness and all that kind of shit, it you know, you the the box has already been built and you have to build all of those nuances within that box. Uh-huh. I don't like boxes. I don't like to be restrained. I uh-huh. like to build new boxes, new experiences, uh-huh. and it felt impossible for me to do that on the stage. So I went to the page and honestly, everything comes down to experiment. So I didn't make a dis- like a intentional decision to like not go back to the stage. I still intend to slam again when I can find a way to like make sure that the work that I'm doing on the page translates. Whenever I figure out how to do that, I'm going back, at least just to have fun. Mm-hmm. Um, but for me, it was mostly like, I started to realize that the work that I was writing, I enjoyed more than the work that I needed to write to get back on stage. And so I just veered more one direction. And then the, the other thing too is Wait, like- go back for one second. I'm trying to catch that. Mm-hmm. These people always walking. Walking. They're walking heavy. <laughs> but the, the, the work that you were- 
were creating on the page mm -hmm. was go back like the work that I was creating on the page um felt more uh it felt more charged it felt okay. more interesting to me in that moment all right um and so I just sort of like it didn't make an intentional decision to be like all right I'm done with slam I'm done with the stage yeah. I just was so compelled by the work that I was making and the work that I was reading that that's just the direction that I went. And then I realized, too, like, I'm not a particularly competitive person, naturally. Um, but I am driven, right? right? And so the way that that translates is, like, I don't really care about beating someone else. Right. But I do care about winning, right? And in Slam... Okay. In Slam, <laughs> you have to beat someone oh, else okay. to win. Okay. But in the literary world, right, like, you and I can publish a poem on the same day and two very different outlets right in two yeah. very different platforms and like neither of us had to like kick each other out of the way to do that yeah, yeah, but we yeah. still won right, right it's, right, it's right. still a mark on the board yeah. and so I really just got tired of like I only wanted to compete with myself to be honest mm, yeah. um and like when I published that first poem and I realized that like out of my peers I was one of the few people at that age who were publishing work I was like oh this is winning I like this yeah. I'm gonna do this some more yeah. um and then I just I just kept winning, and it, it the the possibilities keep opening up for me all over the place. Like, I don't know this, the page just excites me so much. There's so much that you can do. There's so much you, that you can experiment with. I just right. So let me. Who out. who are some of the poets when you're making a transition onto the page? Who mm -hmm. are some poets you were reading that are like challenging you of what can be done? Um. Damn. So many. It's gonna be really hard for me to recall, but. I'll say first things first, a, a lot of my peers as they were transitioning as well and my mentors. So, Aracelis Gourmet, okay. Gourmet, some people say uh, Aracelis. <laughs> she was one of the people that challenged me, I think. Um, you know, Morgan Parker was popping up around that time too. Hey, boo. Um, and I didn't know anything about her and she was like brand new. She was at Columbia. Um, Angel Nafis, okay. who had been transitioning at that time too, or or sort of like walking the balance. Yeah. Um, let me think. Who else? I mean, there were a lot of people. Mahogany Brown was making that transition, or 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 was walking that line rather yeah. at that time too. Um, and then there was like Patricia Smith, right? Ooh. Who yeah, the... is one of the most profound and prolific spoken word slam poets that people know about but she's also like one of the best motherfuckers in the game period right yeah. like the books that she writes are some of the best books i've ever read and so i'm like watching her on screen but then also reading should have been jimmy savannah and i'm like this is crazy how she did that yeah. oh shit <laughs> right yeah. and like that was really exciting to me i would say that like if no one else patricia smith really opened that door for me because she was not abandoning one for the other she was like oh no boo i does this i does both and yeah. better than everybody else right and i was just so compelled by like the way that she walked that line like she was really just mm. fucking it up yeah i love her so much love you auntie <laughs> <laughs> and so let me ask you when you're reading mm -hmm. her when do you you know i know you did you did Kalalu. Mm -hmm. You've done Cave Kano. Mm -hmm. You've done like the the places of repute that a poet, especially a black poet, goes mm -hmm. through. Mm -hmm. Sort of your your sword is getting your sword is getting sharpened in mm -hmm. these places. Mm -hmm. Um when do you meet Patty? You know, I Patricia met Smith. Pat Patricia Smith very young. I met her when I was maybe sixteen or seventeen at Urban World. She taught a workshop. Um, and like, Patricia Smith is a very warm, loving person. And I think in general, the literary community, even to this day, but back then for sure, the black literary community was, was nuclear enough in New York City anyway, that people were still very tethered to like building the youth community mm -hmm. and mentoring. So, you know, you had folks all up in there, you know, you had Patricia Smith teaching workshops, Aristotle's Carmen, you had, um... Damn, so many folks that like I encounter every day now mm -hmm. that I like came or call. Michael Cervelli runs the joint. Like there were people who were like very active in the literary community who was just coming and doing workshops. So that's where I met Patricia Smith. Um, and it it wasn't until a little bit later in life, yeah, that I was like hungry for her to like see my work. <laughs> yeah, when you felt like you had something to get something her. to show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But by then she was already auntie, so <laughs> it's not. It didn't even. No. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also expected, like knowing the community that we've been reared in. Right. 
What you gonna do? Not be great? Yeah. Good luck. <laughs> like, yeah. If that's something you didn't want to do, you should go elsewhere. Word. Mm-hmm. So let me give give me some language mm-hmm. on this. Two things. Um, one, how would you, def- how would you describe poetry to someone who who doesn't know what it is? Like, what language would you give poetry? I think that poetry is one of the few mediums where um, visual art, sound art, um, and just like the weird shit in your head, like meets at an intersection and like has a medium that can be like deeply explored and excavated. Okay. And I guess like what I mean by that is you have lyricism, you have images, like actual images in the words, um, and none of that means anything if you read the poems out loud and they don't resonate or move you. Mm -hmm. Um, So there's just sort of like all these access points that people usually go to to like understand art, to create art that's just like already embedded in this one medium. Right. Um, And I think that it's, it's, it's the place that people go to when they want to answer questions mm-hmm. or when they want to ask questions, right? That's dope. You come to poetry to, to have your questions answered or to ask questions. This is like a form of an essay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, so how would you now describe your poems? How do how does someone reading, if we, if we rip your name off of your poem, mm-hmm. how does someone know they're reading a Come On Felix poem? Uh, You know, I wish I had somebody else here who could answer that. Um, <laughs> um, I think you know a Kimon poem by my lexicon. So my words change often. I don't. I try not to use a lot of the same words, but um, because I work in politics and because I'm so policy based, um, you'll often see a lot of that political sort of like super didactic multi-syllabic language in my work. Okay. Um, you know, using words like framework, contract, construct, right? That yeah. are like based in high academia and like based in the ivory tower yeah. that is brought down to the folks, the people. The, yeah. So I use that kind of language when I'm talking about the homies. You know what I right, mean? Right, right. So, um, Straddling that fine line. Yeah, straddling that fine line, I, and I think so. I think that's one of the ways that you recognize my work, and also recognize my work with the with the kind of liberty that I take on the page in terms of like how yeah. I manipulate white space. Right. I think that um, my language and my poems definitely dance, um, and my collections dance together. Yeah. Um, and I feel like you. When you say dance, mm-hmm. I mean, don't want to cut you off. But yeah. I'm cut, I hate when I, I hate when I, I hate hear when it. You do that. Just so, cut me off. All right, but when you say a, when you your poems dance, you mm-hmm. mean I mean that they like literally on the page like dance and skate um, and they move. Okay, they flow. So you know you might open a like if you open this book, you open it to the middle and you'll see a poem that is like, you know, does like this. And then you flip to the next page and there's like one stanza up here and then another stanza down here and then another stanza up here, right? So you'll never find the same orientation from page to page. Okay. Um, and the way that, that the orientation moves the reader's eye um, allows, I think, for this, um, this, what's the word that I'm looking for? It's sort of like simulation of dance. Okay. For the so, like, you have to follow. You yeah, have you move. have to follow. You have it's to not move. Not something aesthetic. No, you can't. Okay. It's not. A, you can't be lazy. <laughs> you can't be lazy. I feel like. Yeah, I would say that. If you know, finally, I think that that's the other part of how people understand my work or identify a common poem. They're hard. They're difficult. They're difficult to read. They're difficult mm-hmm. to understand. Um, they're difficult to enter. That's important to me. Um, and maybe that has a lot to do with just like how I was raised and like how I came up, but like. Shit's always been super difficult. The mm. successes that I have, have, I've had to like crawl and bleed for that shit. Yeah. And so my poems do that too. Like my poems make the readers crawl and ble- and bleed and. Right. You know. So. And you want to create that simulation of like reading a poem is like really getting to know who you are. Mm-hmm. So you want to create that. Mm-hmm. That's dope. So yoke. Yoke. Chat book from yeah. Kim and Shit Press. Yeah. And. The homie Mahogany Browns yeah. Publishing House. Yep. Put this out. 
Yep. And I read about, you know, first of all, like the, one of my favorite poems is the, uh, and you can explain this, the Zimmerman mm-hmm. poem, that's mm-hmm. the Zim- was Zimmerman uh, tape one. Mm-hmm. There's another poem on the back that is not tight. Is that a part of that same poem? Mm-mm. Okay. Because it wasn't tight, so I wasn't sure. Yeah. But what I like about this chat book mm-hmm. is the ways in which you manage to talk about these larger political, socio, like socio-political things that affect the black body in mm-hmm. one way, but yet you're able to manage and preserve that joy mm-hmm. that comes from everyday living, right? Mm-hmm. Like, you know, some of the happiest moments that I've had came in, like, the darkest times. And, you, and mm-hmm. I remember you talking about that in, like, interviews where, mm-hmm. like, it's not just all misery mm-hmm. for black people. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times, the more we tend to, like, start to excavate that pain, then we start to dwell in it. And mm-hmm. we forget, like... Nah, like, you know, nah, that was actually a good day. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, so mm-hmm. how did you, how did you, how did, why was that important for you? Um, I think for me in this manuscript, I think I was really building the foundation of um, how I want to be defined, the kind of work that I want to be defined by. Mm-hmm. And I think that like that, that thin line between, you know, the larger political issue and then like the small joys in life like I feel like that is just how I live anyway right is that I'm like deeply invested all the time in like what's happening at the national level what's happening at the local level but also like I want to get drunk with my friends and I also want to shoot the shit right and I wanted to bring that kind of like openness to the work that I was making okay um and so like with the Zimmerman poems um in specific like you know the Zimmerman trial was happening while I was in my first year at my MFA program right and like When I was at Bard, I was the only black person on campus in the program at that time. And I think like the only black writer that they had in a very long time. So on top of feeling very privileged and very lucky, I also felt very like skeptical of like the whole situation. Yeah. Right. It's a get out situation. Yeah, totally. And then the trial was (laughs) happening. And I, and at that time too, this was like one of the first trials of this nature that I'd been alive for. Right. Um, and I don't know if you remember, but it was a very charged time. And I was super isolated. Yeah. Like I wasn't with none of my friends. I wasn't with any of the people that I would go to and cry with. Um, and so I remember like watching the trial in this, like literally in the ivory tower, you know what I mean? Like in this barred library on like the top fucking floor, looking out the window and also like watching this trial. And I just felt so isolated and so guilty for being so lucky um and I just like knew that I would be it would be I wanted to write about the trial but I knew that it would be disingenuous and um and like maybe just like a not good poem if I wasn't invested in um in illustrating that part of the situation and illustrating how guilty being where I was and watching it from my vantage point made me feel on top of so emotional that this was happening at all yeah mm-hmm. and i you know and, and i think that happens a lot with like like black edu like black uh like predom- yeah mm-hmm. educated kids like myself like mm-hmm. you know you're not the one in the streets getting mm-hmm. shot so you feel like you're not doing your service mm-hmm. and so like yeah you know i remember when um niggas went to the to the the protest that they had when i think some of I don't mm-hmm. think when he got acquitted, it was still, I was still in school at the time mm-hmm. at Pace. And I remember like the anger felt like not fake and not, not necessarily performed, but obligated. Mm-hmm. Like, and not that people were not angry about what happened to Trayvon, but mm-hmm. they felt like if I don't show this anger, mm-hmm. what does that say about me? Mm-hmm. And for me, I remember like I was running the BSU at Pace at that time. Mm-hmm. And I remember getting like, niggas was like, oh, like, why are you not protesting like mm-hmm. and on this shit? So it felt like, and my my way of protesting at that at that point, at least at pace, was like there was kids who wasn't getting like you know niggas financial aid was fucked up and all these things. I so that. I felt like there were like things that were that were more. And this is this is a very hard line to talk about without like I felt like those things were more immediate to the to the black kids at pace mm-hmm. than like. The idea of like performing solidarity mm-hmm. with a situation mm-hmm. that was elsewhere, and mm-hmm. it's hard to say that without saying, "Oh, you selfish." Mm-hmm. But I feel like that uh, fear of looking selfish, especially for Black people, mm-hmm. is what keeps us from like, you know, being able to write things and do things that have an importance that lasts beyond the moment. Mm-hmm. Because so much of you know, even when I went to the to the protests that happened, it was just weird, like. 
the cops were all like, it was a protest that was you could be angry, but you were angry. You could be you angry. You could be angry but, within their yeah, constraints. Like, yeah, like it's like you could be angry yeah. from ten to seven. Yeah. At yeah. And we're gonna be right there yeah, the yeah. whole time. Yeah. Then you can take your angry ass home. Yeah. <laughs> and it was like for me, I just didn't I was was like, yo, I didn't know I didn't like that just made me question everything. Like, how is this anger? Like, you organize your anger right. in this way. Like, yeah, we're going to be, we want to meet at 14th. We're going to take this yeah. anger to 28th. Then we're going to bust a left. Mm-hmm. Then we're going to go yep. to um Starbucks. And, then, and it was just like, for me, I was just like, nah. Yeah. And that's one of the, it's funny because like, I feel like that is really what shaped this project. And, and yeah. you know, there's a lot of these poems or some of these poems are going to be in um, my full length collection, Build Yourself a Book. And like, there was one very- Build your, wait, slow it down. Just, you, you got that New York speed. That and New York I know speed. I'm trying to, I, you know, we're trying to get, I think we have some national listeners. And I know they've been like sitting here like, this girl is talking fast. I talk fast. Sorry, y'all. Yeah. Now you listen to slow, but you know, <laughs> just slow it down for the slower listeners. Build yourself a boat. Coming out from who? Coming out from Willow slash Aquarius Press. All right now. Fall 2018. All right. I'm very excited. It's my debut full length collection. Okay. Um, And some of the poems that are in Yoke are going to be in that book. And I think the most... I would say that this the this conversation that I'm about to reference was one of the two life changing conversations um, that I had in my first year. That and was the thirty minute signal. I see you looking. That was oh, just, that was the thirty minute. Yeah, we just we just, just yeah, we got minutes. the production. You know everything. We run a tight ship here, <laughs> as tight as we can. Tight as you can. Yeah. Um. Anyway, so real quick, Anne Lauterbach, who was one of my faculty at Bard, love her so much. You know, and I know that this came from a lot of different places, but. She looked over my work and she was like, are you trying to represent blackness? Or are you trying to present blackness? Oh, I remember like immediately being like, who the fuck is this old white lady asking? Don't ask me no questions. Yeah. But then I like went, I was like, irritated. And I like talked to some of my, to some of my cohort and they were like, ooh. And I was like, bitch. Right. It was, you know, it was charged. A series of, of one word. Of what the this. fuck is happening. And then I went home and I thought about it. And I was like... She, she's onto something. What is the distinction between presenting blackness and representing blackness? And I just, I made a decision about what I thought both were. And then I decided that the work that I was going to do was going to present blackness versus represent blackness. Explain that. What does it mean to represent? And, and yeah, for me, just, for me. No, no, no. And this is a good, yes. this is a good, exp- like, but so like, for me, yeah. representing blackness meant talking about anger. Mm-hmm. Whereas presenting blackness meant talking about not just the anger that the in, that the moment made me feel, but the other emotions that were intrinsically connected to it and the way that it directly like applied to my body. So yeah. obviously everybody at my program expected for me to write about Trayvon and about the trial. Duh, I'm the only black person there and it's happening while I'm there. But in my first year, I remember reading some poems that were like very sad about the trial. And then like all the white people in my crit just crying. They just cried. They didn't say shit other than like, oh my God, that was so powerful. I'm emotional. They didn't give me no feedback. They didn't give me no edits. Mm. The poems wasn't no better when I left. People right. just cried. I remember thinking like how limiting that was. Right. And realizing that when you represent blackness, it gives white people an opportunity to to just encounter blackness, not to engage, not to investigate. Yeah, and then present like a voyeurism. A voyeurism, precisely. And then when but when you present blackness, right? Yeah. So when you say like, here's the anger I feel, but also here's how crazy y'all look crying at me while I'm reading about this thing when you should be doing this. Like that's a presentation of blackness, mm. right? It's a presentation of this sort of like kaleidoscopic um um, vantage point right. of like being in this body uh-huh. <laughs> and seeing all around you all these contradictions and weirdness and, and moments that are like funny that you can laugh at. That's what I wanted to do. I never wanted to write a book about blackness um, that was just sad or just happy um, or any or just anything. Yeah, because that's not what blackness is. So like, just put put on display. And this is I, I know like this is your baby. Yeah, but you like do something for me. Read a read a poem in there that you think. Is represent is representation of blackness uh-huh. and everyone and is that's present. Presentational. Yeah. Okay. I think so people can see what it what how it how it looks like in poem form. Yeah. No, I'm happy to. Okay. I love how all writers look through their book like they ain't write it. I They're know. Like, where is where is the okay? What page is this on? 
So this is um, this poem I think is representational, and it's still one of my favorite poems in the book. Um, yeah. But it's Zimmerman Testimonies Day One. I think that's is that the one that you like the most? That was the one I like. I like no. I and, and when I say I like the way it played off the other poem. Gotcha. Like how it followed behind each other. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so but I want yeah. This is um, a, a representation of poem. Zimmerman Testimonies Day One. Quote: These assholes, they always get away. George Zimmerman. And then the sky is bleeding. A soft cry, and I am at the head of it. A six-pane window, a vein of lightning, a bath in imminence, and what kind of Arizona? Which pack of Skittles? I like the dark side pack, but those came out last winter. Trey's body already, a dovetail in moist ground, and which newscast had his father come home to arrange the dry bones in front of, and how long had he waited for his one boy to return from wherever night-crusted boys roam in the salt of Floridian South, and who plans to rob anything in socks and sandals, and in the courtroom, the prosecutor taps play on the tape, Trayvon's wet scream, the only thing living Living a full life and his mother, a mare overwrought with the front seat of her son's slaughter, chases the breath out of the courtroom, the big door whipping behind her, running and running every day of this trial, he dies. Mm. So that's what I would call representational, though I love it very much. Right. Um, and then presentational. And then presentational, I'll do... This poem, it's a little long. It's uh, called Testimony, for example. I am embarrassed to admit that I was most at fear when realizing that nothing made me different from the red skin of my friends sent up river anymore, except for maybe the flat land of the cop's hand over my thick belly down my pants. In bookings, one floor up is closer to home. Anywhere is heaven if getting to it rewires the pious roof. Some of the women in my holding cell have not moved up in days. Sorrow clings to the shy metal. I smell my own and welcome it with willful slumber. The clocks are broken, abandoned perspective. The prostitute next to me is badgering me, wants to know why I'm in. You sell your pussy too? I shake my head and awe. Any girl this pretty in here because she too pretty, Diablo. I tell her it's for something else, something unrelated. She says she wishes me luck, tells me to hope for a male judge. The bitch is state, straight hate on the pretty face, and that is all I am in this place. A mirage to the male guards, a staple to the others. Another floor up, new cell, Alexis from high school. Her best friends jumped me in the dean's office in 11th grade. She didn't jump in. Loyalty's white tongue is split. What's new? Some weight. A baby, she says. Already? Already. Where's Khalil? Stupid question. Were any of them? One up. More sex workers. Diaz, I see you. You going back to Rikers with me. You think that shit is funny? But what about, but what a better way to enter a field of entrapment than with auxiliary limbs? It's not fucking funny. Shut the fuck up. What better way to stomach the dry fuel? If I get sent up, I hope that Alexis goes with me. Mm. Crabs in a barrel. Mouths brought to water will drink. 11 p.m., 12 hours later, I'm set to see the judge. It's a woman judge. I'm fucked. My mother is in the third pew, her face peppered with spelt guilt. I don't even look at her in the eye. Don't want her to see the day's waste, the handcuffs cutting into my wrists, the red sugar pooling about my skin. The judge, ass flat on her podium, chastises me for a thing I didn't do, and I can feel the fire behind my nose, spreading, spreading out. I spy the door of no return. I spy the guard's cocked gun. The face of freedom bows to a different game now and sings of the slaughter with my throat. Mm. So, like, that's not even one of my favorite poems, right? It just, like, is a poem where I was able to, like, literally just, like, be in the body of blackness versus like talking about what it meant to be black. I was just there and I was talking about just being there and like all of the moments of being there and how charged those small little moments meant right. when the prostitute next to me says this thing and the girl that I grew up with who jumped me in the bathroom is pregnant with my ex-boyfriend's bro. Like to me, those are the nuances of black. It's a lot. Those are the nuances <laughs> of blackness, right? Where it's not necessarily painful. It's not necessarily harmful. It kind of, just is, right? But also yeah. throughout the book, that's like probably the only no. poem I've written about getting locked up. It's not like all my poems are about getting locked up, right? No, but that, but that's what, you know, and those, and you know, in a weird way, like, I think, like when the Trayvon Martin thing had happened, when he, when he got murdered, 
and then all these other murders started happening. Right. There was definitely this. I even felt it like there was a, a different sadness for me because it was like, nah, I got to do something. Right. But what it did was it undermined everything I had already been doing. Doing and thinking just, about. And that constant thing of like yeah. feeling like you're not doing enough when what's being done against your body is not even your fault. Exactly. And, you know, just to like round this out, like I think if I had to like define it really with like a few sentences, representational poetry centers whiteness inherently mm. it must so in the Trayvon the Trayvon Martin poem wouldn't exist if George Zimmerman didn't exist if George Zimmerman didn't shoot him right George Zimmerman has a place in that poem he begins the poem and the poem about getting arrested and bumping into my friend from high school whatever ain't no white people in that poem right. there's the judge but the judge could very well be black right right, right, right. Don't it's, even, yeah. it doesn't matter it's, it's right white story. supremacy is an is a is a subtext it doesn't need to be announced for you to know that it's manipulating yeah. the world and who and who and then who and c- comes to read and appreciate those poems is also that sort of thing right mm-hmm. because it's one of those things where like even for myself like i got so violent against hearing the representational shit and mm-hmm. writing representational shit mm-hmm. when it was just like these things were not satisfying any inquiries that i had about life they yes. weren't maturing any yeah they weren't answering any questions yeah and like i had to move from like every time somebody black was murdered by the police to saying something mm-hmm. to like figuring out what is there for me to actually say about this moment? Mm-hmm. Because like I've had friends who've gotten killed by cops mm-hmm. and I wasn't sitting there turning out essays for them. Right. So it was like, okay, what is there really to say about these moments? And I've said less, which makes me look less woke, less right. whatever, but mm-hmm. it's like, am I really engaged with my real life? Mm-hmm. Right. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, am, am I performing mm-hmm. Or am, am, am I performing, like, this idea of activism? Mm-hmm. Or am I actively, like, checking in on the people who, like, yeah. are real to me? Mm-hmm. And I feel like in a lot of ways, like, that, that's why I said I like the way this poem, this this chat book manages to, like, understand that mm-hmm. you're straddling those two worlds. Yeah. And so that title, though, I've always wondered about the title. Build Yourself a Boat or Yoke? No, Yoke. Yoke. Um, I feel like, so... The sort of way that I explain it is like um, a lot of the what's in this book is about like growing up and like, you know, being yeah. in the hood and like just acting up, kind of fool. Yeah. Um, and like yoke you up or like, no, no. Yoke, that's the different yoke. Yeah, that's, that's a different okay yoke. Yeah, that's why okay. okay. No, but I, I think <laughs> about it as like, you know, when you get an egg. Yeah. Um, the egg has two options or three maybe. The egg can either become a chicken, right, okay. or a bird. Or it can become yolk that you fry and eat. Uh You actually have no idea, right? Like what, if it's going to become a thing that reproduces or a thing that like leads to consumption. Mm. Um, And I feel like in those moments where I was a kid, where I was like cutting school and like acting up, somebody told me that I was going to be consumed. I would, I would have believed them, right? Somebody told me that I was going to be a chicken. You're going to be somebody's omelet, girl. Somebody's omelet. I was like, yeah, (laughs) sounds right. (laughs) So that's right. Um, but I genuinely didn't know. I had no idea. And I didn't know that those experiences were building the foundation that would uh, that would put me at the crossroads of like being a chicken or being an outlet. Okay. <laughs> and I feel like it's those those moments um, where weird shit happened when I, where I was a kid or like, you know, whatever. Your best friend is fucking in the room next door. You're like, what's going on? Where am I? What's happening? <laughs> right. And then the Trayvon Martin stuff happens years later. And it's me sort of like looking back at those moments and recognizing that I was like already on my way to like being the chicken mm-hmm. um, and had no idea. And just thinking about how many other young people are in these spaces of development um, that they're told only go in one direction yeah. that can only lead one way. Um, and just wasn't true for me. Like statistically, I'm supposed to be one of those kids who was like supposed to be a te- like supposed to have a teen pregnancy. Yeah. Was supposed to be locked up. Yeah. Supposed to you know be fucking the chief of the bloods. Like in the well, state case. <laughs> Not that I wasn't, but that's very like the point. specific <laughs> statistic. <laughs> you statistically <laughs> gonna be fucking the five star general of this game. Of this game, yeah, absolutely. You supposed to be a ruby tomorrow. Yeah. Um. Yeah, yeah that's what yeah. it meant for me. Okay. So. Damn, this is this is this is giving me so much to think about. Um, how do people follow you? How do people find you? How do people stay in touch with what you're doing? You can find me on Twitter at Come On From Pluto, K A M O N E from Pluto, because yeah. I'm out of this world. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> All right, now, girl. <laughs> or you can find me on Facebook. Um, I also have a website, just camonefelix.com. <sighs> C-A-M-O-N-G-H-N-E. Felix or clfelix.com. Two domains. It's lit. That's how you do it. Um, Facebook. Twitter. Twitter. Google. Instagram. Instagram. Cam Killer. K-A-M-K-A-L-L-A. And then what you got? Any, you got? I know you got. You got an event coming up. You're going to be reading for the release of Nicole, of Nicole Sealy's book. Ordinary Beast. Incredible. I'm Give us the date on that. Um, September 23rd. And <laughs> I'm not really good at dates. But at Studio Museum. Yes, yes, yes. In Harlem. I'm right. Am I right? Shout out to Thelma Golden. So, uh, November 24th. It's Sunday. A Sunday at Studio Museum in Harlem. I'm deeply, I'm so excited. I can't even. I love Nicole Ooh, Sealy so much. That's dope. Yeah, I like that. Okay. Um, Nicole, I love you. Yeah, yeah. What time is that? What time is that event? Uh, three, I think. Okay. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, 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 yeah. that's sounding good. That's yeah. sounding good. Sounds like else? you should come to. Yeah, I'm going to be, I'm going to pull up. Um, I got a reading uh, the day after Thanksgiving at the Poetry Project. I'm sort mm-hmm. of like taking the month off to just be center. Reading at the Poji Project, um, November 24th. And then, you know, stuff always pops up in between. Okay. All over the place. You can find me. All right. So, you know, before you get out of here, I got to hit you with one. That's yours. What's this? It's the... Um, you got like gifts. No, no, of course. You got to... You gotta, we got to bless people. For yeah, it. yeah. I love it. Yeah. So, that's it's the, going right on my little jacket. Yeah. Thank that's you. The, that's the lip pen. The lip pen. Yeah, it's yeah, lit. yeah, yeah. So, it's you lit. know... Come on, it's lit out here. And then last thing before you go, and I don't think I've ever gotten this from you, so I'm fucking up. Literary swag. Favorite three writers. Favorite three writers. All right. Favorite three clothing designers. Okay. Fred Moten, Gwendolyn Brooks, Mahogany L. Brown. Um, and my favorite designers are Chanel, because Coco's lit. Um, I would say <laughs> Madewell for jeans. Like, okay. They make the best jeans in the world. Right on. Um... And Nike. Okay. And we got to talk about, before we get out of here, let's talk about this Fred Moten cosign. Because pe- pe- people, people, people don't know about... It's like, blurbs are cosigns, though. They sure are. Yeah. So, they like, sure that's... Are. You know, I'm, I'm always trying to translate this language for people who don't know what the fuck a blurb is. Mm-hmm. Right? So, let's talk about... Let's talk about Fred Moten real quick. Who is he in... in who Like, what does a Fred Moten blurb mean for a poet? What did it mean for... What does it mean for you? For me, on a very personal level, I mean, he told me something. He gave me some of the most important advice I'll ever have. And that was, when I was at Bard, none of these people know what you're doing because it's never been done before. So don't listen to them. Find your people, listen to them, and ignore everybody else. And had he not told me that, this book wouldn't be here, the work that I'm making now. Mm -hmm. So that's what it means on a personal level. But on a grand scale, like, you know, whatever. Dog won a National Book Award and, like, yeah. And he's just that guy. He's just that. Fred Moten so, is dead ass that So let's, let me read this. Yes. So what Fred Moten has to say about Yoke, which is in stores wherever books are sold and elsewhere. Make sure y'all get this book. Um, what sustains in growth? Because here we go still trying to become who we are after all this time and the aftermath of all this capture, this burden. Yoke proclaims its infusion with Yoke. Like how the way we grow is marked by what we have to carry. Like how Kamon makes me think, come on, let's go. Let's move in this, through this, like somebody carrying on as she's coming up, smoking and skipping, testing and testifying, sounding and sounding, studying black life, which is the only life to learn how to carry and nourish. Kamon's Felix's poems sing this and they do this too. God damn. This ain't, you know what this is like? This is like when Jay give verses to, to Rick Rolls. Like, <laughs> this is like when you get, like, you don't get the, like, the bullshit verses. Like, you know, when you get, like, the, I'm gonna give you, like, you know, I got, like, this is a beautiful, this, this book undid me. Like, it shouldn't be said about anybody, but this is like, this, you could tell this man. Like, I'm trying not to be selfish because I know that I, like, don't, I shouldn't go back to him for another blurb for my phone length, but to, I show the fuck in. How many verses Rick <laughs> Ross get from Jay? Like, at least one every album? Like, I know. <laughs> like, hey, Uncle Fred, can I? This is better than the last one. Yeah. And it's fuller. It's 70 pages. Hey. You should. So, so next yeah. year, we definitely going to have you on the show year. this time next year to talk about the release of the book. But for now, we got Yoke. We got you doing beautiful work, and we got you being lit. So this has been another episode of Lit with the host, Liddy Interview Fontaine. Pretty Liddy's what they call me. (laughs) Uh, Shout out to the team, Pink Pig Productions. Shout out to my boy, Surreal Jules, who puts the music on it. Um, Do say we need a sponsor, baby. 
send us some liquor bottles because this is sixty dollars a bottle. This shit is expensive. <laughs> um, and we out. Follow us at Lit Platform. Follow me at Yadon. It's lit. Peace out. <laughs>